Hi, Chapel Street Church. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Throughout the month of June, we've joined with our VBS kids to raise money for Water for Good to help a community in Africa. We are excited to share that our kids raised $13,361.98. And with our gifts, it's over 100,000 with more still being counted. This will make a huge impact in that village as clean water and hygiene will be brought to hundreds of children. Thank you for your generosity, both to this campaign and also for your regular giving to the ministries here. One of those ministries your generosity supports is our Masterpiece Ministry. And the mission of Masterpiece Ministry aligns with that of Chapel Street Church, to be a place where everyone can experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact, regardless of where they are in life. This commitment extends to individuals and families impacted by disability. Recently, Pastor Jeff had a meaningful conversation about disability in the church with Jillian Love, a mother whose family is personally affected by disability, and Chris Duffy, the director of our disability ministry. Here's a brief preview of their discussion. Sometimes people think ministries in the church start because uh, really smart pastors get in a room and figure out what the ministry should be. That's rarely the case. It's most often because people see a need and point it out and bring their gifts to bear on it. Tell us the story of how Master Beast even started. It was really a group of moms who had children with disabilities really basically, I think, beating on people's doors in <laughs> yes. the church to be like, why aren't you addressing this? Yeah. Why aren't you this addressing this? This is a need, this? right. This is a need. People would argue and make a case for that people with disabilities are the biggest unreached people group with the gospel of everyone. The beautiful thing about what Masterpiece does is that it brings community back to our families. Chris, you used a, a word, ableism. What is exactly ableism? Yeah, I mean, so just like you would use the term racism or, or sexism, right, ableism, you're really just, you're not showing somebody dignity. You're not treating them as an image bearer, somebody created to be like God. One of the things that is difficult with Kendall sometimes to that point is you know, she's nonverbal and she struggles with eye contact. And so I think there's times when people just assume that nonverbal equals non-thinking, non-feeling, non-seeing. And I think that's kind of that attitude a little bit that you're describing, Chris, is just like assuming that there's not a person in there, and there is. To see Kendall and others in Masterpiece, all of them, um, as image bearers, like Jesus didn't just walk around caring about people, right? He was in relationships and proximity, so then, from caring as you get to know people and show them dignity, then you move to friendship. I would just encourage people to just see, and I think that's a great first step. Don't walk past, don't look down, don't look away. Just start by just opening your eyes and seeing. I think that you will find that the more you look and see, the more your heart opens up to, you know, what can I potentially do here? Where can I fit in in this picture in this family's life? That's, a, that's just really good advice for us on across the board. Start looking and seeing what God is doing and how I can be involved. And we, we as a church are committed to making what God is doing in Masterpiece more visible so we can really see. I hope you will go and check out that conversation. I learned a ton just by being uh, the interviewer of uh, Chris and of Jillian and their family. And uh, if you don't know about Masterpiece Ministry, it's one of the, it's, sadly, it's a, it's a well-kept secret. It shouldn't be. And toward that end, next week, we're going to have what we call accessible worship here at our Kesslinger campus, inviting families and individuals with disabilities to worship with us. As Chris will often say, by the way, Chris looks scary with the beard and the tattoos, but he's not. He's got a heart of gold. Uh, and just talk to him about what God is doing there. Um, he, he'll often say to us that we're, we're all made in the image of God and we need one another, all of us, to accurately reflect, reflect and represent God's image. And so join us next weekend uh, as we celebrate uh, worship together with accessible worship, inviting our, our families and individuals with disabilities to worship with us as we join. And let's bow in prayer as we come to God's word. Father in heaven, we pause and acknowledge that you're the author of life, all of our lives. Every one of us is made in your image, made to know you, and be known by you. And now, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. We've been pouring out our hearts in worship. Now pour into them through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been with us in the summer, you know we're uh, in a series um, called Face to Face. Gospel stories of those who had face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus. 
And there's lots of similarities about these encounters, but each, each story is unique and different. Jesus meets each person at the place of their need. He's intentional, he pursues, and he engages with them at the very place they need to meet and to know him. And he does that for us today as well. We're coming to a very familiar story, especially if you grew up in church. If you didn't, it may not be as familiar to you, and that's okay. Uh, it's the story of Jesus and uh, the Scottish man named Zacchaeus. Do you know he was Scottish? It's because he was we. Yeah, if you don't know what I'm talking about, some of you, maybe my demographic, or if you grew up in Sunday school, there's a song, right? Do you know the song? Should we sing the song? Uh, some of you are like, what? Okay, we're gonna, you're, gonna learn, I'm, you're gonna learn. If you know, you know, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And the Lord said, Zacchaeus, you come down from going to your house today, from going to your house. To, come on, sing with me. No, okay. Some of you are like, what is happening? Right? Apologies. A little stroll down memory lane. The point, the point, other than it's fun to sing, is that sometimes our familiarity, we think we know the story. We grew up with it. Oh, yeah, I know this one. I, I have, uh, maybe you've had this experience. The last several months of my life, I am uh, hearing God's word, even though I've read it and preached it dozens of times in a, in a way I haven't before. And hopefully that will happen for you this morning as well. Uh, let's open our Bibles if you have them, or you can follow on the screen to Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read the first 10 verses of this story. You can follow in your own Bible or on the screen. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Luke 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. It doesn't sound like it when we read it, but this is a shocking and somewhat scandalous story uh, in the first century Jewish culture. It, it would have been like jaw-dropping stuff going on here because... Jesus, as you heard, they grumble against him, is stopping, acknowledging, and going to the home of, being a guest of, a tax collector. Sitting down and eating with a tax collector. By the way, this is not the first time Jesus has done this. One of his 12 followers, Levi, Matthew, was also a tax collector. And when he called Jesus to follow him, some of you will know the story, Matthew gives a party. Invites all of his friends, you know, those friends, the friends you don't have over. He has them all over. And Jesus is there, and they eat together. And at that party, the religious leaders who are observing this criticize Jesus and his followers, and they say, why does your master, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Notice the criticism? Why do you eat with them? Now, now having a meal with somebody doesn't have the same connotation in our culture. We eat on the run so much. But in the ancient Eastern world, to sit down and share a meal at a table was one of the ultimate symbols of fellowship and acceptance with somebody. We're, we're together. I accept you. Well, that's what you're saying when you ate, shared a meal with someone. And Jesus is always being criticized by the religious leaders for two things primarily. One, for claiming divine authority and talking about the kingdom as if he's the king. And number two, for inviting all the wrong people into this kingdom. Sitting down and eating with tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> There's a rabbinic saying from the Mishnah that says, only the marriage bed is more sacred in the home than the family table. It's a big deal to share your table with somebody. You're saying something about how you view them, their place in your life. Jews believed, uh, going back to the Old Testament, Genesis 18, the story of Abraham, that you could unintentionally entertain and eat with angels, 
So hospitality is a big deal. But there were also very strict rules about who you should and should not eat with. Abraham Joshua Heschel, a Jewish scholar in his famous book called Sabbath, writes this, plus having a very sweet beard. We become like those who eat, we eat with most often. Think about that for a minute. Is that true for you? Over the course of your life, I don't mean like you stuff your face in the car on the way to the next thing with somebody. The people that you most often sit down at a table face to face with and share a meal with, have they had a profound impact on your life? Going back to your childhood? It was certainly true in the ancient culture. There's something powerful about this. Now let's go back to verses one through four of the story. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Now the story is familiar, but we need a little historical context here to make sense of it. So Israel, as a nation, is under Roman occupation and Roman rule. There are puppet Jewish kings, uh, but, is, but Rome calls the shots. Um, the story takes place in a city called Jericho. Jericho, you might remember from the story of Joshua, or maybe you know it from Veggie Tales, you know Joshua and the Big Wall, whatever. However you know Jericho. Jericho is uh, a Roman colony in Israel. It's about 20 miles, you'll see on the map here, it's about 20 miles northeast of Jerusalem. Uh, so this is Jericho today. Um, well, it's still Jericho, but they're from Jerusalem there. About 20 miles northeast, right near the Jordan River, just north of Dead Sea. Uh, this is the map of Israel today. So you'll see it's in what we call the West Bank today. Pretty far from the Gaza Strip where all of the, uh, the war and the awful things are happening right now. Uh, so this is Jericho. Jericho was a wealthy city, a population about 20, 25,000 people. So a little bit bigger than Geneva or Batavia, or a little bit smaller, excuse me, than Geneva or Batavia in terms of population. But it's a wealthy trade center. That's a big city in the ancient world. Uh, it was wealthy. Um, it was uh, the, an ancient city. By the way, it's the, one of the oldest cities on the planet that's continuously inhabited. Today you go to Jericho, it's in Palestinian territory, but the modern hotels and buildings are mixed in with the ancient ruins. You'll see an image here of the city today, known as the City of Palms. This is a view from one of the modern buildings across the palm groves there to some of the ancient ruins of Jericho. In Jesus' day, it's a wealthy uh, tax center. The Romans set up the distribution centers for, for taxation, these sort of regions and hubs, and Jericho was one of those hubs. Um, so Zacchaeus is, is, lives there. Now remember in, in Luke 18, if you've studied this, you know Jesus meets a man on the way into Jericho named Bartimaeus, who's physically blind, and Jesus gives him physical sight. In a way, he's going to help Zacchaeus, who, who can see physically, to see him and us as well, spiritually. Rome required heavy taxes to fund the expanding empire. And the way they did this was they sold taxation rights, like a franchise rights, to wealthy individuals who then appointed individual tax collectors under them to collect taxes from people. So you have to think about this for a minute. If you're a Jewish person, you're paying taxes to Rome, but you're also paying the salary of the tax collector and the chief tax collector, the one over that region. That's Zacchaeus. This is a system of exploitation and corruption and oppression. And what, what makes it worse is it's done by Jews. Rome is selling these rights for taxation to Jewish, their own people, who buy the franchise rights, so to speak, appoint other tax collectors, and then use the backing of the Roman military to extort the money. So they're charging way beyond what Rome needs to, to line their own pockets. And, and Rome doesn't care as long as Caesar gets his. They don't, they're not worried about it. This is, this is the context in which Jesus meets this man named Zacchaeus. So let's go back to those first four verses for a minute. He entered Jericho, was passing through. What do we know about Zacchaeus? There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. A couple facts about Zacchaeus. He's wealthy. He's a, a chief tax collector, so he's doubly despised by his own people. More so than the Romans, they're Gentiles. Jews should know better than betray their own. Plus he's short. This, this short little cheat. Nobody likes. That's the picture of Zacchaeus. Now you might, well what's short in, in, in the first century Middle East? 
Anthropologists have done studies on this. They estimate the average height for a man in, in the first century uh, uh, world of the Middle East was between 5'2 and 5'5. Five five. That's average. We know Jesus. There was nothing remarkable about his appearance. He was average. Maybe you don't think of, oh, no, Jesus is six foot four with blonde hair and blue eyes, right? No, Jesus was somewhere between 5'2 and 5'5. Five five. And Zacchaeus is short, so short, that he gets a mention of his stature in, the, in Luke's gospel. So he's not like 5'1". He's, so, he's significantly below average enough that you'd mention it. What does that mean? 4'8"? He's a wee little man, right? He's, he's like a hobbit, right? He's a little guy. And he climbs up in this tree. So we know some things about Zacchaeus, but here's the most important fact about Zacchaeus. This will become the defining fact about him. And I would suggest the defining fact about any of us who want to encounter Jesus. It's right here. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. This is the part about Zacchaeus that matters most. He wants to see Jesus. He wants to know who he is. Now I'm projecting into the text here, but what would it be like to be a short little cheat who's wealthy that nobody likes in the culture? You got money, but maybe very few friends. You have position and you have some authority in the, in the Roman world, but your own people don't want anything to do with you. He's heard about Jesus, heard rumors, heard stories. Maybe he's even heard about the healing of the blind man just outside the city a few days ago. He wants to see, he wants to know who is this man? And what he's going to find out is that Jesus has been seeking him as well. The word for seeking, the Greek word is the word, is the word zeteo. It means to like earnestly desire, to pursue, to strive for. It's not just mar mildly curious. He wants to know who Jesus is. And what he finds out is that Jesus has been seeking him all along. We find out in verse 10, right, that at the very end of the story, we're told that the Son of Man, that's Jesus' favorite reference for himself, came to seek and to save the lost. When you hear the word lost, maybe, what do you, maybe you think of the show, lost. Well, I don't know what you think of. We might think of like, oh, in, in, you know, in the wrong place, needs directions. Like, how did you ever go anywhere before you had phones with, with map apps on them? Some of you are like, I don't know, I probably couldn't. Like, I'm serious, I, this generation, I, do you, some of us are old enough to remember, remember maps, like atlases? You pull them out of the side door and you like, find the map and like, you're like, somebody's driving, you're doing, by, it's like impossible. I don't know how, you're looking for exits. Or remember when you used to write down directions? Like, look for the big tree, the metal bridge, and turn left. <laughs> how do we get anywhere? It's not talking about loss that way. It's not talking about in need of, like Zacchaeus just needs some guidance. The word literally means destruction on the path to death. That's the kind of loss we're talking about for Zacchaeus until he meets Jesus. He's utterly lost. Okay, let's look at what happens in this encounter. The first thing we see Zacchaeus doing in order to see Jesus is that he climbs up a tree. The first thing I will put it this way, if you want a genuine encounter with Jesus, whether you've been in church your whole life or it's your first Sunday, if you want a genuine encounter with a real Jesus, you must do three things. The first thing is you must get over yourself. You must get over yourself. Now, what does climbing a tree have to do with getting over yourself? Um, it sounds mildly insulting, right? Get over yourself. It means adults don't climb trees, especially in the first century uh, Middle Eastern culture. It's a shame and honor culture. Dignity, honor, respectability matters greatly. Grown men don't climb up in trees. They don't, children can do this. That's fine for kids. But grown-ups don't do this. Zacchaeus does. My wife and my youngest son went downtown Chicago in 2016 when the Cubs won the World Series. <sighs> it's a far cry from where they are now. But I remember um, hearing stories, I couldn't go with them, but hearing stories about grown people climbing light poles and trees to get a glimpse of the Cubs, you know. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that we are fools for Christ's sake. We are willing to look foolish for the sake of Jesus Christ. And it does look foolish to climb up in a tree. What are you doing up there? What is he doing? Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 18. Some of you will know this story. Oh, that, go back. That was a tree. Forgot that. That's a sycamore tree. That's called the Zacchaeus tree. There's actually two of them in Jericho. It's probably not the actual tree. But to give you an idea how big these trees were, 
Uh, he, he's climbing up. Can you, can you see him, the wee little man? Can you see him? Squint. He's up there looking for Jesus. But in Matthew 18, Jesus tells this story. His disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. They have heard the stories about the kingdom, and they're assuming it means political and military kingdom. And they want to know who's going to have positions of power. Like, we've given up everything to follow you, so it's going to, it's going to pay off, right? And they're arguing about this. That time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I love this story. Jesus and his followers, they are fundamentally misunderstanding the kingdom. They're not getting it. And how does Jesus deal with their misunderstanding? He, he has an object lesson. It says he calls a child to him. Maybe he knew the kid by name. Hey, Billy. Probably not Billy. It's first century Jewish. Right now. Hey, hey, Jacob, come here. Can you see him? Little dirty face, snot nose, little kid. Unless you become like this, you cannot enter the kingdom. Childlikeness. Unless you're willing to, to recover something you've lost. Now, interestingly, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, this, is not, this is just for free. He says, uh, we leave childish things behind us. Do you remember this passage? When I grew up, I become a man. I leave behind childish ways. So there's something we should grow out of. But Jesus is saying, you must become like a child. They're not in conflict with each other. What's the quintessential negative characteristic of childishness? Class? Selfishness, right? Me, mine, I'm at the center of the universe. But Jesus says you must recover a sense of wonder and awe and innocence and trust. One of the tragedies about our life is that as we grow up, we grow out of the stuff we're supposed to hold on to. We lose wonder, joy, innocence, and trust. And we hold on to selfishness and me first. And it's supposed to be the other way around. If you want to meet Jesus, you've got to get over your selfish pride. Your worry about looking respectable. You must become like a child. Children naturally get this. We become too grown up, I think. In the Chronicles of Narnia, the Susan, you know the four children. Uh, there's uh, Edmund, Peter, Lucy, and Susan. Susan's the oldest of the girls. And she's no longer able at the end of the story to enter Narnia. Do you remember this? She can't get in anymore. She can't see Aslan. She can't visit that land. And it's kind of sad. And do you remember the reason why? She's grown up too much. She no longer believes. She chastises Lucy with those silly, childish games we used to play. And Lewis, all his life, w would correspond personally to people who wrote him letters. And they, people wrote him letters, children and adults, about all kinds of things. And in 1957, a little girl wrote him a letter asking whatever happened to Susan, because it's kind of sad. And Lewis writes this back, an excerpt from his letter. The books don't tell us what happened to Susan. I think that's funny, because he's the author. <laughs> She's left alive in this world at the end, having by then turned into a rather silly, conceited young woman. But there's plenty of time for her to mend, and perhaps she will get to Aslan's country in the end, in her own way. Can you see it? A little girl say, well, why, why can't Susan see Aslan? Oh, she's too grown up, too conceited. But it's not, it's not too late. She might still get there. I think in a way Zacchaeus in the climbing the tree is willing to lay aside his dignity, his, his need to look respectable, his concern about what everyone else thinks to see Jesus. You ever find yourself feeling insecure or apologetic about your faith around certain people who you know don't share it? Nervous about what they'll think? Spiritually speaking, to grow up does not mean to stop believing in the supernatural or in fairy tales. Just the opposite. At the heart of our faith, the very core of what it means to be a Christian is not a set of rules to follow or philosophies to believe in or good advice uh, to put into place in your life. The core of it is miraculous, unbelievable things. The God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, took on the, the flesh, entered the world through a mother's womb, became a, a human infant, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, conquered death and the grave, rose bodily, physically from the grave, appeared to his followers, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, and will come back the same way he went. 
That's not good advice. That's not like, hey, you might wanna put that into practice. Can you believe that? Let's not be too grown up to believe that. That's the core of what it means to be a Christian. When we grow up, we do need something better than fairy tales. It's called the gospel. And all the good fairy tales point to it. Second, if you want a genuine encounter with Jesus, you must get over yourself and you must get over the crowd. You must get over the crowd. If the main thing keeping Zacchaeus from meeting Jesus is his own pride, I think the next biggest barrier is physically the crowd. He actually can't see over the crowd. He has to get himself to a vantage point where he can see Jesus because his view of him is obstructed by other people. I think that's a great metaphor for many of us in this culture today. Your view, my view of Jesus is often obstructed by the behavior, the attitudes, the words of other people. And other people can be a great encouragement in your faith and should be, but sometimes they're a big barrier. And you and I need to get ourselves to a vantage point where I can see him clearly for who he is. This crowd, by the way, in verse seven is a rather nasty, moralistic and self-righteous crowd. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. I hear this from people all the time. If this is what being a Christian means, then I don't want anything to do with it. Mahatma Gandhi was once interviewed by the Christian missionary Stanley Jones, who said, you quote Jesus all the time, why wouldn't you become his follower? Gandhi's part of his response has become famous now. I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Tragically, many people have given up on Christianity because they just can't get past the crowd. It works kind of like this. If Christianity were true, then it wouldn't produce these kinds of people, but it does seem to be producing these kinds of people, so maybe it's not true. I think every one of us needs to do something Zacchaeus did. Get up in a tree, get over ourselves, and be able to see Jesus. How, how, how? To meet him. We're given four biographies of Jesus. Historically accurate, reliable testimonies of who he is, what he came for, how to know him. You need to meet him and see him for who he is. Not just accept what I say about him or what Twitter or X says about him or your TikTok Christian, whatever, you know, the little sound bites you get, but to meet him in the gospel accounts. And you know what you'll do, what you'll find when you, if you do that? What you'll discover? Jesus is every bit and even more down on the religious, self-righteous, moralistic people that, as you are. Those are the ones he rails against. In fact, one chapter earlier, Jesus tells this remarkable parable, which is incredible thinking who he's gonna meet in chapter 19. This won't be on the screen. Let me just read it briefly for you. Jesus tells the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. We're told in Luke 18, verse nine, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He tells that parable to those who trusted in their own righteousness, thought highly of themselves, and he's gonna meet Zacchaeus and live out this parable in the next chapter where we're studying. I, one of the things the Lord has been teaching me over the last six months is that I too need to get past my perception of what everybody else thinks and says and meet Jesus personally again. Maybe you do as well. Even in the church, the crowd can be a barrier. 
to meeting Jesus. We ought to be a help to each other. Okay, last, if you want to have a genuine encounter with Jesus, you must get over yourself, you must get over the crowd, but that's not enough. It's not enough just to see Jesus from a distance up in that tree, right? You must respond to him. You must receive him joyfully. Receive him joyfully. The New International Version puts it, welcome him gladly. Let's look at verses four through six and then uh, then six through 10. Look at the text once more. Make some observations here. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he's about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So uh, then, and when he saw it, uh, he hurry came down and received him joyfully. When they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also was a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Notice what Jesus, what does Jesus say? I must stay at your house today. And the people grumble. He's gone in to be the guest of a sinner. This is not a casual dropping by. This is an intentional coming in to the home, to the very center, the core of of Zacchaeus' life. This is very significant. I'm coming over. I must stay at your house. This is the real shocking point in the story. Jesus stops, calls this guy by name, says, get down, I'm coming over. How does Zacchaeus respond? He hurried down, came down, received him joyfully, welcomed him gladly. I want you to notice two aspects of the story as we prepare to come to the table to finish this morning. Just in a simple statement, the two aspects are the order of grace and the transformed heart. First, the order of grace. Notice what Zacchaeus does not say. It's tempting to read it and misunderstand it. It doesn't work like this. The order of grace is not, Lord, I give away half my possessions and I pay anybody back fourfold. And Jesus goes, well, in that case, I guess I'll come over. Now that you've you've done the right thing, I'll come to your house. This is not the order. Jesus, we talk often in evangelical circles about inviting Jesus into your heart. Have you heard this? Maybe you've prayed this prayer, inviting Jesus in. Come in, Lord. That's a good thing to pray. But in this story, it doesn't work that way, does it? Jesus invites himself in. He doesn't ask. He doesn't wait to be invited. He says, I must come in to your house. That's kind of rude. Like if I went went to you, like, I must come to your house today. Huh? The pastor says he must come. I can't say no. What are we going to do? He says, I'm coming over, Zacchaeus. The order of grace is first salvation. First Christ moves in, then a changed life. It's not because I change or I clean up my act or I get things in order that God loves me. It's because God loves me when I'm a mess that I can begin to change. Over and over again, we see this in every encounter throughout this series. In all the pages of Scripture, we see this order of grace. And we say it every week. I hope you never get tired of hearing it because there's something in the human heart that resists it. There's something in me and in you that can't quite believe this is true for me. I think I got to get myself together first. Like the man who told me, I'll come to church, but I got to get my, 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 house, my, my life in order first. That's like saying I'll go to the gym once I get in shape. It doesn't work like that. Jesus says, I'm coming over. First John 4, 10, you'll, some of you will know the re- reference, or not the reference, the verse, right? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Romans 5, 8, while we were still righteous, no, sinners, Christ died for us. After Zacchaeus announces he's going to give away half his possessions and pay back those he's cheated, Jesus does not say, now salvation can come to this house. He says, this is a sign that salvation has already come to this house. Zacchaeus is responding to the grace Jesus has already given him. He's already over. He's already come in. He's already accepted him. 
And he's, now Zacchaeus is beginning to change. Jesus desires to be with Zacchaeus. He desires to be with you and with me in the midst of your brokenness, with all the stuff. You never go to somebody's house and you're like, how is their house all so much cleaner than our house? You ever feel that way? It's not. They just put it in a room like you do. They shove it all in there, right? And nobody goes in there. You know, oh, it looks nice. You, know, you just buy in, the, you're buying the lie. That's the room Jesus wants to come into. That closet, that room, the, cent, the, the point of the house is, this is the very center of his life. And, and you cannot have the grace of Jesus flowing through your life if he's on the periphery, if he's on the porch, if you keep him on the back deck, where will the guests go over here? He's not coming to be a guest. He's coming in to change you. Grace will always change you. This is the second aspect, a transformed heart. Jesus is not casually dropping by. He's coming into the center. This is what it means to receive him joyfully. Notice a couple things about what Zacchaeus does. The Old Testament law required we give a tithe, 10% of your wealth. Zacchaeus gives 50%. He's rich. 10% isn't gonna cost him anything. He's responding to grace. The Old Testament law required that if you cheated somebody, you paid back the amount plus 20%. Zacchaeus is given 400%. What's the point? If, you've, if you receive the grace of Jesus, you want to go beyond what's required. In every way. It should come into his grace in my life relationally, in my career, in my friendships, in my family, in my money, in my time. The transforming power there. Today, Jesus stops and calls your name and my name. He sees you peering from the tree branches, trying to get a glimpse of him at a safe distance maybe. He calls you by name. He invites you to come down. He commands you to come down. He says, I want to come in. I want to come into the very center of your life and change it all. Will you welcome him gladly? We receive him with joy. In Revelation 3.20, we quote this all the time, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. If anyone should let me in, I'll come in and sit, eat with them and them with me. This is a letter to ch Christians. It's a letter to churches. So whether you don't know him or you've known him for years, he still is saying, I want to come in. All the way in. To change you. It's really appropriate then that we finish by coming to the Lord's table. And by the way, if you did not receive the communion elements, put your hand up. The ushers will make sure that you have them. Just let them know that you need the cup. They'll bring it to you now. Pull that out as we get ready. Make sure everybody has them over there on the side there. Let's pray. Jesus, by your grace, help us to get over ourselves, our pride, our need to look respectable, our fear of what others think, to get past the crowd and to see you for who you are and all of your goodness and mercy and grace and to hear you invite us to your table. Not only, Jesus, do you want to come into our lives, you invite us into yours to sit with you at your table. And as we come now to your table, Remind us that you are the bread of life and you are living water and in you we have life to the full. We thank you that we don't have to earn that or achieve it. You give it freely. Prepare our hearts now as we come. We pray in your name. Amen. If you just peel off that bottom layer and take the bread in your hands. I just want to remind you what Jesus said about himself. He said, he is the bread of life. This is the body of Christ given for you. Eat this and remember him. Scripture says that after they'd eaten together, Jesus poured out a cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins we drink this, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he returns. Let's do that together. Amen. Praise
days forever to our great King of Kings. If you're here this morning and you'd like someone to pray with you, pray for you, maybe for those very things, to get over yourself in the crowd and to receive Jesus joyfully, you can come down front and meet with me. There's members of the prayer team right back in the lobby in that room with the windows. We'd love to meet with you and encourage you through prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, may the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.